good afternoon and good evening to you, the good people of YouTube. Hope you're all today with Grand Laws of Any World. I am, I'm overly excited, I'm a bit hyper, and it's all really good because everything's going wonderful this morning. I'm having a really good day so far, and I will tell you why quickly before we get into QA Wednesday, everybody. I'm a bit hyper, as you can probably tell. Um, I have new pickups in the gorgeous, let me put that down for a sec. In the gorgeous Oswald Strat, I finally have new uh, pickups in it. The SSL ones were not really doing it for me. I was, I was looking for something else. And SSL ones, all they were amazing pickups. SSL ones, they didn't. After a while, we played them. I was like, they're, they're not doing, they're not responding, and sounding the way I want them to sound. And I had to have them at kind of weird angles to get them to kind of brighten up. I had to have the treble side quite high and the bass side really low. And, then I had it really low, and it, I just couldn't get them to behave. And eventually, I kind of I grew I grew a bit weary of them. So I have brand new pickups, everybody. These are Evil Sheep, uh, 1955 replica Strat pickups that uh, Mr. Evil Sheep has very very kindly done for me, and they are awesome. And I will do a whole video on them at some point, uh, very 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 near in the future. I promise. But at this point in time, you heard them at the intro jam. They just... They... they uh, uh. Can you tell? Anyway, yeah, so I'm loving them. I'm absolutely loving them. They are... Uh, uh, yes. Just yes. Yes. Love them to bits. Flying a flag today. But they are really awesome people. It's just... It's just... Bought this guitar... Well, not bought this guitar to life, because it was already to life. That's not the word. It's just giving it a different dynamic that I love. Because these pickups respond really nicely. The, the SSL ones were, were good, but they never had that... They didn't have quite the response I was looking for, if that makes any sense. But these did. But anyway, enough talking on that, because I will do a video on that some point in the future, I promise. But, um, and another thing is, too, uh, one of my favourite computer games of all time, Resident Evil 2, has just been announced that it's getting remade, and it's out at the beginning of the next year, and I have pre-ordered that. So I am overly excited today. I'm sweating and I even started the video. Okay, so anyway, with enough on that, let's get to question one today, everybody. Calm yourself, Dave. <sighs> it's not gonna happen. Not gonna happen. I'm too excited. I am too hyper today. Okay, so um, question one today is what pedal should I buy to cover songs by Jimi Hendrix, Eric Clapton, and Pink Floyd? Um, uh, there's a lot. There's a lot of pedals you can buy that will cover those things. If it was me, what I would pick... If, if, if somebody's... If I didn't have, like... If I had no pedals and somebody said, Oh, you're doing a, a Jimi Hendrix gig tonight. The pedal I would go and buy is the Marshall uh, Governor 2 Plus. Because um, it just... <laughs> kind of sound and then you can also kind of it's got that kind of thing and the Dave Gilmore thing I can't remember the come through num solo So that's the one I would go and buy myself personally if I, if I was going to do it. So I'd recommend that. But there is also the Marshall Blues Breaker pedal. That does a really, really cool Jim Hendrix, Eric Clapton, Pink floyd -y thing. There's the uh, Tone City Golden Plexi, which I think you mentioned in your email you were thinking of getting. Um, that does awesome things as well. Um, 
the Marshall Jack the Marshall Jackhammer does that thing really well as well. If you crank the gain up, it's not as good as I would say the Governor for that kind of thing. The, the Jackhammer I think excels at that kind of broken up cleanish. You know that. The Jackhammer really excels at that kind of really fat, cleanish kind of sound, which is really, really nice. Whereas the, the Governor is that more voodoo child. You know, that, that kind of full out kind of Hendrix thing. Um, it's probably a little bit more gain than Jimmy had on his kind of basic clean without the fuzz. But that's the one I would pick myself personally. It's got the right kind of... Um, It's just the one I, 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 I would always go to for that kind of thing. So that's what I would recommend. The Marshall Governor, Marshall Blues Breaker, Tone City Golden Plexi. Um, the Boss Super Overdrive was really good as well. That was really good for that kind of thing. It was a bit picky what fuzz is it like and, and overdrives it like though. I didn't, I, I found that a bit, I, I sold mine because of that. It was a bit, un, it, it, again, it was, it was like the DS2 and the Ibanez as well. They were a little bit finicky. Uh, anything else I can think of? I mean, one other pedal as well. Uh, the green carrot pedals, uh, Corn Star, um, that I that I've that I've got. Uh, just literally over there. Um, that pedal does an amazing Hendrixy, Claptony, Pink Floydy thing. As an amazing pedal, the green car green carrot pedals, Corn Star. It's just that even on the, for Jimi Hendrix, you kind of want the gain about half. And for like Pink Floyd, it wants to be on four. It's never like mass gain kind of pedal, but it's got a real nice vintagey kind of um, sound to it, which is really awesome. So that'd be my that'd be my five picks for that. People of a tube, uh, if you were gonna go and play Eric Clapton music, Jimi Hendrix music, and Pink Floyd, what would be the uh, pedal you would pick, the distortion pedal? Um, you know, to get that for the sound. People of a tube, what would you pick? Leave a comment below. I'm going out of my mind already. I can just feel the excitement. I'm just, I'm, I'm, not, I'm having a bit of a buzz moment, everybody. Okay, so question two today. I hope that's answered your question. By the way, I hope that answers your question. Now, that'd be my kind of five picks. So, uh, question two. Um, uh, I recently bought an Epiphone Les Paul Custom, but I can't seem to get a clean sound out of my amp. Right, um, that's not too unfamiliar for an Epiphone uh, if, you, if you just bought it. If it's factory set, um, the humbuckers are probably quite high, I would say. Uh, I know mine was when I got mine. I remember like, because I, I had um, my, my Squire Strat and my, my Washburn and the Washburn's humbucker was always dead low and it was always very cleanish on the bridge pickup no matter what it. When I got my Epiphone, I found it really, it was very distorted on the clean channel. But very, a lot of distortion in it. Uh, what I would recommend you do is uh, get a screwdriver and lower the pickup. Lower the humbucker. Re you know, if you want it to be really, really clean, you want them as low as you can go without them falling off the bobbins. Be really, really careful if they don't fall off the screw because then you've got to take the strings off and take the take the shell out and, and, and re-screw it back on, which is not a big job, but it is a bit of an annoyance. So um, what I would do is I would recommend you just lower the, um, lower the pickups down if they're quite high above the pickup ring, then you know, if they're quite close to the string, you want to lower them down. Because uh, on my Les Pauls, I like... Well, on my Les Pauls, I have the, the bass side really low and I have the treble side really high. Um, it's Peter Green had it that, that way. I've nicked it off Peter Green, basically. I'm, I'm, I'm just a thief. Uh, thief in the night. Anyway, um... But yeah, I, I would say recommend lowering your, uh, the, your pickups away from the strings as much as you can. Like I say, without them falling off the screws, be really, really careful they don't fall off the screws. Uh, it's not a big fix if they do, but it is a bit of an annoyance because you got to take all the, you got to take the strings off and and undo the undo the uh, the pickup ring and get it out and then re-screw it. So it is, it is a bit of a pig. So I would recommend it um, <clears throat> on your phone, your Les Paul customer. I'll just lower the pickups. 
And uh, you also said how we'll know when it's clean. Trust me, you'll know. It, 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 you know, because uh, I know for a fact my Epiphone sounded almost like, well, almost like that. <laughs> when it, when it, when I got it. And, you know, if I have a pickup to really high on it, that's kind of what it sounds like on a clean setting. But you'll know when it sounds really, you know, really, really clean. So, um, yeah, so that's what I'd recommend you do. Just lower those pickups, especially humbuggers. Because an Epiphone humbuggers are quite dark. Their voice quite, especially for wax dipped humbuckers, they're quite dark anyway. So I would just say sink your pickups more than anything. I think it's it's um, to get a really crystal clean, less poor kind of sound. It, for them to be clean, you, you want it. You want the pickups fairly low. So, um, so I hope that's answered the question. I hope that helps. Um, the fear of me answering questions wrong is already upon me. <sighs> I'm always terrified. I'm giving bad advice. It really freaks me out, and it haunts me for a long time. Okay, so I hope that's answered your question. I'm going to go on to question three now. Uh, question three is, why does my Zoom G2 thicken up my sound even when I have every module turned off? Okay, um, honestly, I'm not really sure. Um, but the thing thing with the Zoom G2 is, is when everything's off, but you're not in bypass mode, you've still got, um, you've still got a level uh, control, I do believe. Let me, let me just check one sec. Be back in a sec. Yes, uh, I just checked. You've still got level control on your pedal. And um, with the Zoom G2, the lower the level, um, the darker the sound is, the higher the level, the uh, the brighter. So it might be worth checking out the level dial on your Zoom. You said it's not a complaint. Uh, um, yeah, because that's really cool, isn't it? Yeah, you have a, something that just fattens up your clean, you, you know, you sound in general. Um, but I think it's just basically to do with there's still things active inside the pedal. It's still giving you um, something, so to say. If it's in bypass mode, you know, it's it really is kind of like, you know, nothing. It's just the sound from your amp. It's really transparent. But as soon as you click it off bypass mode, even if all the modules are turned off, you will still be getting uh, some kind of signal alteration, so to say. It'll, it'll still be kind of like, you know... Um, changing things in, in, in a way you know it, it won't be ridiculously obvious like it's like say some with like some of the like compressions and stuff like that but you still will be getting some kind of effect that like i say will fatten things up especially if it's level dial uh around 70 80 it normally starts to get really uh, it starts to brighten up around the 90 point so um so if you've got it between 70 and 80 and and then you know just below 90 you know, you're going to get a bit of a, a bit of a boost fatness wise with the, with the Zoom G2. But honestly, I don't, that's what I, that's my experience. Um, having used the G2 bypass for, for, a, I don't use it bypass that much with every, all the modules off, but I never use the pedal in bypass mode. I always have it set to a bank, even if the modules on the bank are off. Because like, like, like you said, it, it does seem to make everything sound a bit better. It seems to tighten everything up and just make things nice. So, so uh, that'd be my explanation. That's that that from my experience, that's what I would say. It, it was doing it like you know with with the volume, it, the experience of the volume controls that I've got on the G2. That like the lot higher it is, the brighter it is, the lower it is, the darker it is. So um, so yeah, that's 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 what I think is 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 the deal there. So um. Yeah, I hope that's answered your question. Um, get back to my uh, normal place. Where am I going? Okay, so yeah, hope that's answered your question. Um, I would say that's the reason why, but people of the tube, if you know why, then please correct me. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm going to move on to question four now. I can't count. I'm still buzzed up about the pickups and Resident Evil. So <laughs> Anyway, um, question four. Uh, have you played the 20 watt Marshall Silver Jubilee head and would it be loud enough to gig with? Uh, yes, I luckily have. Um, a very, very, very cool guy uh, bought two guitars off me and he bought his Silver Jubilee mini head for me to try as well. Um, and uh, it was really awesome amp. It's a really awesome amp. The Silver Jubilee mini is really awesome. And would it be loud enough to gig with? Oh yes, it it's 
blisteringly loud. And it, it, when it's on the clean channel, we tried it really quickly in here. Uh, on the clean channel with the volume cranked, you get this awesome distortion on the clean sound. So, you know, people always say like, you know, oh, the, the Silver Jubilee's the cleanest Marshall amp. It's like, well, yeah, not when you crank it up, it isn't. Yeah, uh, I, I think I said it in my last John Fashanti video. Um, being a valve amp, the nature of it will be, you know, you know especially being a Marshall, um, the nature of it will be the loud, you know, the, the more you wind up the master volume, even on the clean channel, the more distorted it will get. It, I'm, I really want to get my mitts on one, one day, and I'm going to attenuate it. And, uh, or maybe not even attenuate it, just go, go somewhere else and just crank it up with no attenuator. That'd sound better. And, um, Nothing gets attenuators though, but um, but yeah. So you know, just to just to play through that sound, it's a really cool classic sound. It's not clean. It's it's that real nice classic Marshall broken up clean, where it's just it's overdrive really. It's not really clean. But uh, yes, I have played through one awesome amp. I would highly recommend if you're going through um, going through if you want a silver jubilee and you can't quite stretch to the head, which is like a grand or something. Um, you know, because the the mini is. I don't know what the mini is, but the the twenty watt the twenty watt is something. It's a lot, a lot less than the, the the full size one, but um, yeah, I would highly recommend it. And yes, you'd definitely be able to gig with it. They are very, very, very loud amplifiers, uh, and we were running it for a four twelve as well, and it sounded unreal for a four twelve. Sounded really, really good, and I was very sad to see it go, but uh, but yeah, it was awesome. But um, so yeah, oh yeah, definitely loud to gig with. Definitely recommend it. Really awesome little amp. Need to get my mitts. I want. I want to have a go on the hundred watt one, just because John Shanty uses it. Um, nearly did. We nearly got two in at, when I was working at Old Hat. We, we nearly got two my old original Silver Jubilees in, but unfortunately the deal fell through and they didn't. They didn't materialise, and I was absolutely gutted. I was like, but anyway, yes. So. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend it if you're, if you're after that kind of thing. And it's definitely hard enough to gig with, indeed. Okay, so question five today. I'm motoring through these questions. And I hope I'm not talking like this. <sighs> and it made me need to take a breath for a sec. Okay, so question five. Um, I have learned all five positions of a pentatonic scale in every key. What now? What should I focus on to get better at soloing? And why do famous guitarists use notes outside the pentatonic boxes and still sound great? Okay. What If you've learned all your five positions in your pentatonic scale and you know them in every key, um, one end to the other, and you can just go to them like that, then now what you need to be doing is learning your favourite solos by ear and figuring out where they're going and what notes are they using and the tonality of the guitar solo. If that makes any sense, like um, uh, for for an for an example, um, Jakey Lee talks about tonality uh, in his video talking about the end of Bark at the Moon solo. The uh... this bit, that thing. He talks about the tonality of that because I always played it like that, but the tonality is wrong. Because it's it's on the it's on the G and the B strings, not the B and the, the D string. So that, that note on the D string is too dark compared to that note on the G string. So what I would recommend is you do you want you want to go and start picking apart your favourite guitar solos and learning and 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 learn and, and like stealing licks basically stealing kind of like you know little blue. <laughs> little kind of runs and stuff and making them your own and also another thing you want to be doing is improvising to backing tracks uh there's a, there's a trillion and one backing tracks on, on youtube that are awesome to do this to and just just cue one up that's quite long i mean ideally you want like an eight minute backing track and there are a few blues eight minute backing tracks and um what you want to be doing is just basically just noodling over all positions because then what you're doing, you're putting your knowledge and your your yeah your your knowledge of a five position of a pentatonic into a practical way. It's not it's you know you, you you're playing you're not just running the scales. 
you know, like that. You, you know, you're actually using them in a musical way. So, and you want to be going between them. You want to be going up and down the neck. You want to play like linear, linear, I can't say that word. Up and down the neck. You know, you want to play across the neck instead of up and down. Um, that way you'll get a more of a musical kind of feel. And you'll, like I say, you're putting your knowledge of the, 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 the boxes into a practical use instead of just um, theoretical. Because uh, basically what you've done, if you learned the five positions of pentatonic scale, you've learned, um, you've learned the alphabet. Now you've got to learn how to make words out of those letters. So, uh, so yeah, I would go away. I would start learning guitar solos, your favorite guitar solos, and figuring them out by ear. And what you know would be key to that. Like, you know, like, um, like say for instance, you want to learn Comfortably Numb by Pink Floyd. You know, the last solo is in B minor pentatonics um so knowing that you can then start to figure out you know it's just a pentatonic box and how is he using it and then you can kind of start improvising there's, there's a really good backing track to pink floyd's comfortably numb on YouTube, there, there was, I'm not sure if it's been took down actually, come to think of it. but the guitar solo is extended for like four minutes. And because it's such an awesome chord progression, you can just noodle and wang away. So, um, but yeah, it's really important to just play around and mess about. Now you know them, you need to use them practically, not theoretically, it's, it's really important. Um, so, is there anything else I can think of? Yeah, learning solos, improvising over 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 backing tracks is key. Um, and through doing that, you will, like I say, you're, because you've got kind of, if you've learned solos and you've stole some kind of like, you know, kind of real classic kind of, you know, classic kind of blues licks like that, you've, you've got a fail set, you've got a fallback. So if you're, um, if it, say for instance, if you're in B minor with the comfortable numb solo and you're down here, and you get a bit lost, you can always revert back to, you know, you can go back to that as like a, as a, as a fail safe, so to say. Um, but it's really important to steal your favorite licks. It's really important, you know, to, and because through doing that, if you steal a lick from Dave Gilmore and you steal a lick from Peter Green and you steal a lick from Jimi Hendrix and then Eric Clapton, all of a sudden you get this amalgamation of all of them eventually in your playing, you become, you know, Eric Clapton, Dave Gilmore, Peter Green, and, um, and Jimi Hendrix all in one. You know, it, certain licks no longer just sound like a Jimi Hendrix thing. They sound like a Jimi Hendrix, Eric Clapton, Peter Green, and Dave Gilmore thing. Um, if that makes any sense. But it's really important to, like, oh, I like that lick, I'm going to figure it out. And using your knowledge of the five position of pentatonic scale, you know, you should be able to kind of, like, you know, find your way through that, uh, hopefully. I hope this is making sense. Got a horrible nagging doubt in the back of my brain saying, you're talking rubbish, Dave. Um, yeah, uh, so yeah, that's that. And also the outside notes, like you say, like, you know, if they're not just, you know, just playing boxes, because uh, guitarists like Dave Gilmore, Eric Clapton, Jimi Hendrix, they do, because they play up and down the neck, they play with extra added notes. Like, like they're not going to go... start using different notes and bending as well like you know you can bend half half step or a full step so um yeah that's what i would recommend do next is, is start to pick about guitar solos start to incorporate some of those licks into your own playing and just mess about improvising you know, just, just forget rhythm playing. If you want to get good at lead, forget rhythm, forget all that. Just focus on improvising. Link in those shapes together, playing up and down the neck as much as you can. Try to kind of get out of the playing up and down and just try to, you know, start in a different position. You know, if, like, if your song's in B minor again, start here. And then, you know, even try and avoid that box altogether. Just 
make up little exercises, like say, like missing the the the, the minor pentatonic box, or going through it, like um, again B minor. <laughs> You know, and, and doing little runs like that and descending. You know, just make little, get, get like, you know, fun things with it. Like say, like, all right, I'm going to improvise to the comfortably non backing track. But after the stock Dave Gilmore phrases that I've kind of learned, said it all figured out, I'm just going to start off low and work my way up. You know, so after, um, after say, um, after that. That bit, kind of. It's really hard to do it about backing, but I can't just noodle it, it just sounds weird. But, um, yeah, just try that. And I say, just forget rhythm altogether. And just focus on your lead playing. And just, as you're improvising, you'll start to hear things. You go, oh, I like that. And then go, you know, and it'll log itself. And then, you know, oh, I don't like that at all. So you, you won't do that again. You'll learn. Um, but it just comes from hours of playing. Just sit down with your guitar, your favourite lead sound, stick backing tracks on, and go nuts. And it's, you know, if it's you hit a wrong note, it doesn't matter. If you mess up, it doesn't matter. If you fall off a string, it doesn't matter. If, you know, whatever happens, it doesn't matter. Just have fun and just enjoy the fact you know the guitar neck up and down. And like I said, if you've got stock phrases like, like that, you've always got a fail safe. You've always got a fallback position to go to if you kind of go, oh, bit lost. You know, because there's a there's there's a uh, interview with Eric Clapton where he's sat in front of a wall of marshals, and he talks about that. He says, "Oh yeah, he's got stock phrases he works from, so he'll start with a stock phrase and then go off, and then if he gets a bit lost, he'll come back to it." So and and that's what th that's a really re that's really really cool advice. It's a really really good thing to do is to have those stock phrases. A really good stock phrase is this. all that, which took me absolutely years to figure out. I saw. John Fashanti doing it and James Dean Bradfield from Main Street Preachers doing it and, I was, and Slash doing it. I was like, how is he doing that? It took me about a year and a half to figure out like, that. And it was such a breakthrough when you do it. It's, it's, it's insane. But uh, they basically get out of jail free cards, uh, so to say. If you get lost, you can go back to those things and it just you know gives you that ability to kind of... Um, But it kind of gives you, it kind of buys you that time. Because if you watch these great guitarists, they seem to be able to bend time. Like people like Eric Clapton, they just seem to have all the time in the world when they're playing because they're not ever scared about where they're going to go because they know they're going to be okay no matter what they do. Because they, they, they know that um, no matter where they are on the neck, they've got something they can do if they get lost. Uh, you know what I mean? If 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 the brain kicks in and they mess up, they can just turn off again and just kind of get back into it. You know, just by going into a little cool little lick. So, um, so yeah, that's what I would recommend. Pick apart guitar solos, start to steal licks that you like from each individual person, start to incorporate those licks with your knowledge of the five position of the pentatonic scale into a backing track and just improvise and just play about and you will find your own way. So, um... And you'll find your own sound as well, and you'll find your own kind of voicings and phrasings and stuff like that. So it'll come naturally eventually. So I really, really hope that's answered your question. Um, an extra added notes is is something I've covered in the Rory Gallagher series, uh, my Rory Gallagher series in the in the second uh, second lesson, kind of it's called unlocking the neck. So, um, but yeah, it's it's just they're just kind of like extra added notes to the pentatonic scales that just kind of um, I would I, I want to say they're modal, but I don't honestly know. Um, but yeah, so I really hope it's answered your question. Uh, we're going to go to question six now. Uh, I'm going to buy a valve amp. Uh, question six is I'm going to buy a valve amp very soon. Uh, which one is best for the John Fashanti tone? Marshall JCM 900, JCM 2000 DSL 100, or the Marshall DSL 100? Um, personally, 
I would go for the 900. Um, I'm going to have to have a drink a sec, sorry. Everybody, my uh, throat is getting dry from me talking like a freight train. Um, personally, I'll go for the JCM 900. I love the 900. It's a really awesome amp. Um, it gets a lot of flack. Um, I've heard people call it like um, the anemic brother of the JCM 800 and... People saying it's not a it's not a true valve amp because it's got some kind of solid state thing in it. It's like you know, I don't know. It just comes across as a bit nitpicky, really. Because at the end of the day, the J seven nine hundred is an awesome amp, and loads of people have used it over the years. James Dean Bradfield from Actually Preachers uses it. Sounds immense. Um, you know, lots of people use the J seven nine hundred, and it's just it's just an awesome amp. N Nigel Tufnell, his Ghost of twenty, uh, and it's awesome. Um, but yeah, I would recommend the JCM 900. Out of those three, I would go for the 900 myself because what you can do with the 900 is you can get the, you can get it to, to break up because you've got a kind of a gain kind of dial. You can kind of, kind of get it to break up and then just um, get that John Fashanti Town from the amp, which will then make the DS2 and the Ibanez wife. You've got them behave, um, and it's it's just ten times. I, I like it more than the DSLs. The, the dual super leads I've never ever really got on with. Uh, I tried a triple super lead, and I didn't like that at all. The triple super lead just, it sounded too waspy. It was really, it sounded really, it sounded better with humbuckers, but it didn't sound very nice with, with single coils. And I just didn't really, I didn't like the triple super lead. I don't really like the DSLs either, the dual super leads. They're not really, if not really my choice. So what I'd recommend there is the JSM 900. I think it's a brilliant um, I love the 900 bits. If and they're really cheap, 900 second hand are really really cheap, and they're really awesome amps. I I used to play through one. If I wasn't playing through the Marshall Valve State or a Marshall Plexi when I worked in Old House, I was playing through the 900. And the JSM, I'm, I really wish I demoed it, and I didn't demo it, and that's my own stupid fault because it was an amazing little amp. Well, not amazing little amp. It was it was ridiculous. It was it was the it was the Nigel Tufnell model, and the master volume went to 20. It was hysterical. It was amazing. Uh, and it, 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 it definitely didn't go to 20, but it was very, very... Uh, well, on full tilt, it would it blow your fillings out. Let's put it that way. But yeah, I would recommend J7900 myself for a John Fashanti tone. Um, you can get a really cool, broken-up, cleanish sound out of it. It just takes a bit of tweaking, but you can do it. Uh, so... But, but, Nothing against the dual super leads. I just personally don't don't get on with their sound. I just find it a little bit too waspy for my for, for my taste personally. I find the 900 was a lot darker, warmer, and fatter sounding. So yeah, I would recommend the JCM 900 myself uh, personally. If I, if I was if I was going to recommend one of that one of those three. So um, especially for a John Fashanti sound, the 900 is really really cool. Um, the DSLs, you might need a pedal because their overdrive channels might not they might give you too much gain whereas the clean channel might not give you enough gain to do the ds2 and the ibanez wire uh, to make the ibanez wire and the ds2 behave themselves so uh, i really hope i answered your question shut up voice <laughs> um <laughs> okay so final question today everybody question seven and uh it's, it's quite a, a big question this uh, i really hope i answered your question question six i hope that's i hope that's I hope that's something to take away from that. Yeah, I'm absolutely terrified I'm giving bad advice. It, it's the scariest thing in the world to think that you're doing. Okay, so question seven is uh, this one. Uh, during your time at Old Hat Guitars, you must have played a ton of vintage amps and guitars. You praised the Marshall MG HDFX, uh, but how does it compare to an old Plexi or, say, a JCM800 or any classic Marshall? Do you think it's great because it's affordable and a way of getting a great tone, or do you generally think it sounds better than a valve amp? What's your honest opinion? And try to answer as if money was no object. Uh, Johan Seg Segborn's uh, channel has a lot of old Plexi videos. Have you played many of the same amps he has? Okay, so I'm going to break down the question. So the first one is, uh, you praise the Marshall MG, how, but how does it compare to an old Marshall Plexi or a JCM800 or any classic Marshall? I personally think it's up there with them. For me, this is this is my own personal opinion, and I've got a lot of flack over years. I've been thrown out of bands for this amp. 
But I am loyal. I am very loyal to the Marshall MG because I think it's one of the best underrated amps in the world, bar none. I really do. And I think I, if money was no object, I would still have this. I would maybe want it to look like this. The Marshall MG suffers, I think, from a bit of a way it looks. I've never been the biggest fan of the way it looks, but since day one of seeing Jimi Hendrix and seeing these things, the Super Leads, I, am in, I have been in love with this style of amplifier since I first saw them. And I still am today. They are, in my opinion, the best looking amps in the world. The, the, the Marshall Super League, the Plexis. I just, I just, I love them to bits. There is just something to be said about the way they look. To, to me. Again, this is, I, I can only give you my opinion. I can't say it is better or it is worse. It's, it, you know, it's my opinion. But I, I would happily put this up against any Plexi from any era. Uh, I played... My favourite Plexi when I worked into old in, when I worked in old hat was a sixty eight Super Bass. It was um, all original apart from the valves which had been changed, but it was a big hundred watt Plexi Super Bass, and I've got a video of it with it flat out on ten, and it was unreal. And I missed that amp, something rotten because it was one of those amps where it's just there's something in it that makes it really really special. Um, and Norman at Old Hat, he had a lot of plexes. He had a lot of early 70s ones. Uh, I don't... But the earliest one was at 68. He, he did have a uh, Marshall PA 100. I think that was from 70s. 70. Yeah, it was from 97. That was amazing as well, but that blew up. We blew that up by having it on 10 all the time. But that was an amazing amp. But the best one was the, the 68 Super Bass, which... Well, Norman would never sell it, so it'll still be there now. And uh, that is one of the amps I miss. But if somebody said, would you trade your MG for it? Not in a million years. Not in a million years would I trade one of these for one of them. And because that's worth what it's worth, I still wouldn't do it. It's like, yeah, but it's a classic. Yeah, you, know, you can you can argue, you can argue your point. It's a classic amp. It's a bit of history. Yeah, I know. But the MG does more of what I want than that does. To get the super bass to sound good, it had to be run. You had to have the volumes above four on that super bass for it to sound like it was breathing. And, it, you know, we, we had it biased fairly low, so it, it would... Uh, the, the valves would last a long time. It wasn't biased very high um, to get the most out of it. It was biased very low. It was very kind of cleanish ish I, uh, I, I use the word ish. But um, but yeah, you, the volumes had to be at four or above. Full whack, it was just like heaven. But at that volume, it was just horrifically loud. And you couldn't be anywhere near the thing. It was just too much. It was just too much. But but yeah, I, I would put the MG, the, the, the HDFX, up against any Plexi. I really would. I, 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 I'm not being funny. Uh, and I would... I would probably still end up picking, picking. Sorry, the MG. I I love the MG. I really do. It's not. I'm not saying it just you know, for for whatever reason of like you know this that and other. I am saying it because I love these amplifiers. I have one, two, three, four, in this room. <laughs> I've got four in this room. I've got another one through. I've got another one through in my in my bedroom, and I've got another one down. And I've got another two downstairs. You know, and that's because I love them. I hoard them because I I adore them so much and they are you know along with that beastly monster down there they're my desert island amps they really are so yeah i i really think the mg the the older models like the the these ones especially from 2004 it seems to be like the best year it's like it's like it's like a perfectly aged wine i would put them up against any marshall plexi or any vintage matt valve marshall i've played through i played through an original blues breaker while i was in old hat and that was amazing but they still do that. Uh, I played through that 68 Plexi Super Bass. They still do that, in my opinion. Um, I played through some little uh, 15 watt blues. Uh, 15? Was it a 10? I think it was a 15 watt blues breaker. That sounded like Paul Kossoff. I still pick it. 
There was some small boxes he had, which I would still pick this over it. He had an original 68 mint condition small box. Oddly enough, it's the amp that got us all kicked out of the shop. But, um, because somebody came in and broke the logo. But, um, it, you know, dab of super glue would have worked a treat, but, you know, uh, it doesn't matter. I'm getting, getting negative there. But yeah, um, that was a, was that a 68? I don't know, but it was mint condition. It had a matching cab, salt and pepper cab, and it was just unreal. I think I've got a, I think I've got a video of that on full whack. I, I think it was, it was me and my drummer, John Joe, and uh, my friend, John, who worked in the shop. We were having a jam upstairs, and I had a, a, I had a 335 Gibson from 1959. I was playing through it, and it just sounded immense. I think that's on my uh, old hat playlist somewhere. But yeah, it's still, still, this does that though. I'm, you know, this does that. OD1 is the plexi side. It's like the clean channel on a, an MG is like, you know, a, a, a very, very low volume plexi. Like super, super clean plexi. OD1 is like a cranked up plexi, like all the way. And OD2 is like a JSM 800. Uh, and I got to play through a couple, uh, I've got to play through a 50 watt JSM 800, but not old hat. Uh, I got lent it for a while, um, and that was really, really cool. And I nearly bought it, but I didn't. Because um, I always wanted a Plexi, so, you know. And now I've got the best of both worlds in a MG looks like a Plexi. And, uh, you know, couldn't be happier. But yeah, I'd pull them up against any classic Marshall any day of the week. Uh, whether it would win or not is subject to you. Uh, if I got hold of a Plexi... Which I might be able to do again because that, that super base. Um, if I got hold of a plexi, I already have. I've done. I've done. I did a video, didn't I? Where I compared them, um, and compared them. I would still go for the MG or the Orange, because as much as plexis are great, I, I I still prefer the sound of these and the versatility of these over them. And also, plexis can be a bit finicky. On the set. they can sound great one day and terrible the next. And that 68 super base was like that. But um, but yeah, it, whether it's good or bad is 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 down to the ear of a beholder. Really, it, it's not up to me to say this. I can only say that to me, I would have an MG over a Plexi any day of the week. I've owned I owned a fifty watt small box Plexi for years, and um, I used it a lot, but eventually just fell out. I I fell out with it and uh, eventually sold it. But um, yeah, I would I would have this over that. Um, Okay, next thing was, was, do you think it's great because it's a full way of getting a great tone, or do you generally think it's better than a valve amp? Again, I can't say it's better than a valve amp, because to me, it is, but to you, it might not be. It's all subjective. Everything we do in music, from the guitar we play, to the leads we use, to the plectrums we use, to the strings we use, is all subjective. You know, and they all have an influence on what we like and what we don't like. So I could play through this and get a sound that I am absolutely in love with and go, that's the best sound I've ever heard in my life. And then somebody else could come on and go, I can't stand that. It sounds rubbish. It sounds muddy. It sounds dark. It sounds horrific. Oh, I don't like it at all. You know, you need, you need a valve amp. You know, and this and the other. But that's not necessarily fair because that's their opinion against my opinion. And the only pe the only person's opinion matters when it's down to your sound is you. I couldn't care less about what anybody says about the MG. It makes them cheaper for me to buy them all. <laughs> One day I'll just have a room full of MGs. You know, if people want to badmouth the MG, they can until the cows come home. I'm going to stack, I'm going to stick by them and stand by them till, you know, the end of time because they're just, it's, it's, it's my amp. You know, and I love it to bits. But again, I can't, you know, I to me it's better than valve amplifiers. I don't hear the difference. People have ripped me apart in my valve amp video about that statement. But honestly, I don't. That people, the people say, oh, it, you know, valve amps are more organic and you can hear more overtones and harmonics. It's like, I've played through so many vintage and modern valve amplifiers that I don't hear what you're hearing. And I'm not having to go. I'm not saying it's not there at all. Because, you know, I don't doubt it is. But to me, personally, in my experience, in my hearing, I don't hear it. I don't hear a difference. I don't hear that 
whatever it is, uh, that X fa uh, the X Factor in Valvamp to a solid state. I don't hear it. I never have. And I've played through some ridiculously incredible amps, been very lucky in that way to play through some ridiculously incredible amps. And I'm still coming back to this thing. I'm still always coming back to the MG and the CR120. I have no desire to go out and buy a valve amp of any description. I just don't care. I'm, I'm happy where I am. I, I'm content. If somebody said, oh, you can only have these two amps for the rest of your life, fine by me. I'm, I, I'm happy with that, you know. Um, so whether it's better than a valve amp is down to you, really. Do you like, if you like the sound of it, then, you know, then it's a good amp. If you don't like the sound of it, then, you know, it isn't a good amp. It's not the amp for you, so to say. So, but, you know, to me, I like it more than any valve amp I've ever played through. Um, not saying valve is rubbish, because I love valve amplifiers. I love old valve amplifiers, especially old plexes. Um, old Fender Super Reverbs are pant-wettingly good. But um, they're amazing. And old, old Fender Twins as well. They're, they're incredible as well. They're amazing amps. And old Vox AC30s. Oh, heaven. But I still wouldn't trade one for one of these. Not in a million years would you get me to trade one. Um, yeah, um, yeah, that is my honest opinion. Try and answer if money was no object. That, that is it. That, you know, money being no object, I, I would, if, if somebody gave me a grand and said, go out and buy whatever amp you want, I would probably end up buying about 20 MGs and then giving them to Andy at FA Guitar Cabs to do this to them and just have them, you know, and just sit in front of them at night smoking a pipe with glasses on going, it's good to have MGs. I don't know, I don't know why my pipe would be like this massive Gandalf thing, but it would. But yeah, uh, and also, uh, yeah, the final thing you said is uh, Johan Segborn channel, which is really, really cool. Um, has a lot of old plexes on it. Have you played many of the same amps? Yeah, uh, there's a lot of the amps that he that he plays through. I, I've I've been again lucky. I am a jammy, lucky little sod, and I've been very lucky enough to play through a lot of the, the same amps he's pl played through. Um, very very. You, I I I don't know what I've ever done in my life to deserve what I've got and what I've been able to do. But I'm very grateful for it. If I, you know, I'm very, very grateful for it. And I'm grateful for all you people watching right now because I don't know what I've done to deserve it. I do not know. But I am so grateful for it. And I'm so grateful to all of you out there watching. More so than, more so than, you know, than anything really. It really, you know, it, it's... It's my meaning to be here, you know. This is my meaning to be here to, you know, to, to bring you my love for the guitar and music and to share that with all you are. And that's the best thing in the world. I wouldn't change it for anything. I really wouldn't. And I wouldn't change a plexi for one of these. I really wouldn't. And it's not about money. It's about what feels right. And like I said, I've owned a Marshall plexi. I owned a small box 50 reissue. I had... I had another, I, had a, I just, I just remembered, I borrowed a Plexi Super Lead from Old Hat many, many years ago. Oh, well, that seems like a lifetime ago now for a while. And I had it here and that was incredible. But again, wouldn't trade it for one of these. Uh, the 68 Super Bass was amazing, but I wouldn't trade it for that, even though everyone said it's the Holy Grail. To some people, yes, but this is my Holy Grail. You know, this, this is my home. This is my happy place, you know. These are my happy place, should I say. Um, but yeah, it, it's not about money. It's not about, is Valve better than Side State? Is Side State better than Valve? It, you know, it's not about that. It's about what feels right. And the MGs and the CR120 feel right. Regardless if they've got bits of glass in the back. I don't care. If an amp feels right, then it's right. And especially when they feel as good as playing through these things do. These are those amps, the, M the CR120 and the MG are those amps where if somebody said, you've got a gig, uh, uh, oh, oh sorry, 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 if I was doing a gig and my pedal board died and I had to just go straight into the amp for the rest of the gig and just play on one channel, it wouldn't bother me. I wouldn't care less. 
you know, and and that to me is the sign of an amp that is just like perfect. Uh, again, to me, this is only my opinion. I cannot talk for your opinion or anybody else's opinion in the world. It's only my opinion, you know. And we've all got our own individual opinions, and all of them are valid um, to an extent. When you start getting abusive with your opinion, that's when your opinion is no longer valid. When you start to use bad language and start to belittle and be nasty, that's when your opinion is not valid anymore because you're not being adult about the whole situation and understanding that people like other things that you don't. And that's one of the things I've struggled with throughout my musical playing career. I've, I've, I've been kicked out of bands because I, I refuse to use valve. I've refused to go sell my MGs to get a valve amp. I got kicked out of a few bands because I was using MGs and solid state amps and strats, you know. But at the end of the day, it's like, you know, if you can't get over that fact, the fact that I like solid state, you like valve, what does it matter? Really, at the end of the day, if you can't get over that fact, then I don't really want to be around you anyway. I don't want to be around somebody who can't see past that like I like some kind of fault of mine or, you know, whatever. You know, it's not a fault of mine. I just prefer that. And, if you know, I don't like when people pressure people into getting something that doesn't work for them. It's like, oh, you need a Les Paul, but I want to play a strap. No, you need a Les Paul, but I want to play a strap. No, you'll buy a Les Paul. Only, you know, you only get a Les Paul. You know, it, it's not fair to do that kind of thing. It's like, if somebody wants to use that, let them use it. If it works for them... Who cares what it is? Who cares what it says on the headstock? Who cares how much it's worth? Who cares if it's size state or valve? Who cares if it's cheap or expensive? Doesn't matter. If it works for them, that's what matters. You know, and as individuals, as you know, which what we are, that's all that matters. We need to find our own sound, our own way of playing, and it doesn't matter what it is or whatever. It doesn't matter. In my opinion, the MG and the CR120 best amps in the world you know I, I you know I, I i'm i'm happy for the rest of my days having this setup it doesn't bother me you know i really couldn't care less if an amp's got glass in it or it's got nothing in it you know as long as it makes the sound i want it to make then i, I couldn't give a monkeys i really couldn't give a monkeys i love the mg and the cl120 more than any other classic amp i've played through i've played through a selma um a gretsch Stereo King set. I've played through Selma amplifiers. I've played through old vintage Fenders. I've played through a million old vintage Marshalls. I've played through so many amazing, rare, classic amplifiers. High watts, um, you know, boutique, custom made copies of Fender Basements, all sorts. You name it. But I'm still here. You know, years later, I've played through all that stuff. And, you know, I've, I've done that. And, I'm still with the MG and I will be with the MG forever. I will fly the MG flag high and when I'm dead, I'll have a flag sticking out my grave saying MGs and CR120s forever. Yeah. Solid state rule. <laughs> but because that's what works for me. That's what I love. And like I say, if people can't, if certain people can't accept that, then that's fine. But don't abuse me for it and don't belittle me for it or don't belittle anybody for wanting something that, you know, different to what you like. Because it's not fair and it's not on and it's just downright bullying at the end of the day. If somebody doesn't like something you like, just go away from it. Move away. There's no reason to voice your nasty opinion just because you think you can. You know, I don't I don't like that. I've got, I've got, I've got a kind of control kind of comment there and I've kind of digressed a bit. But I suppose it kind of it kind of ties in with that thing. But yeah, honest to God, you know, the MG and the CR120. I just, they're my amps. They're my amps. They give me that sound that I want, whether I'm plugging straight in or plugging pedals in. It's just there. And it just makes me happy. And I don't care about anything else when I play through them. I do not care. I don't, when I was playing through my Marshall Plexi, my 50 water, I always had in the back of my mind I was terrified of it blowing up. And when I borrowed a JCM 800, I was terrified of it blowing up. And when I borrowed that that Plexi, I was the, the the old Plexi, the Super Lead. I was terrified of it blowing up. And it's, I don't want that in my head when I'm playing. And I like the amp to turn on and have the same sound 
it had the day before today. You know, these amps never sound any different. They, you turn them on and the sound you had yesterday or a week ago or a year ago is still there. It never changes. Whereas with my my Plexi or, or the super the super bass in old hat, some days it would sound good, some days it would sound absolutely unreal. Some days it would sound absolutely terrible and you'd want to burn it in a big fire like the Wicker Man and go, burn, damn you! You know, it would literally be like that. But yeah, you know, um, it all comes down to opinion, you know, and, and, and it's all subjective. It's all subjective. It's all down to what we like as individuals. And that's all that matters. The only person whose opinion matters when buying gear and using amps and using guitars and strings and whatever else, the only person, person whose opinion matters is yours. Nobody else's. No one else can tell you you're doing it wrong. If it works for you, you're doing it right. No matter what anybody says. I refuse to accept the fact of somebody knows how to do it and you've got to follow them. You know, because there's, there's always another way. There is always your own way. You know, there's always something else, you know. Granted, in certain aspects, like, you know, you can't wire a pickup to the bridge <laughs> and expect it to work. You know, granted, that thing. But when it comes down to, like, string gauges, guitar style, pickups, sound, amps, leads, pedals, stuff like that, pickups, um, then it's, it's all down to you. It's all subjective. It's all down to you. It's not up to anybody else to tell you it's wrong or right. It's, it's up to what you like at the end of the day and what you want. So, uh, so yeah, anyway, I think I've rambled on off enough about that. And, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's it, everybody. How, where are we? 45 minutes. Good gravy. Okay. So, um, but yeah, I, when I did, uh, just to finish on, just to, just to finish this off, when I did my video of why I prefer side state amps, people seem to get the impression that I hate valve amplifiers. I don't hate valve amplifiers. I love valve amplifiers. It's just that solid states for me are better and they work more for me. They work better for me. You know, it's just the way it is. It, you know, I, I just, um, I always have got on better with solid states. I've owned valve and this and the other. But when people start to get abusive, like they have done on that video, towards me just because I like that and it's like oh you can't hear the difference you've got bad ears and all this that, and the other it's like that opinion is no longer valid and it just makes me go so what you know so you, let me get this straight you're going to abuse me because I like something you hate okay that makes no sense whatsoever you know it's like it's it's ridiculous. It's like it's like having a go at somebody because they put their right shoe on first instead of their left shoe. So like, oh my god, you put your right shoe on first. Oh god, you're a freak. Oh why do you do that? It's like what the hell? What does it matter? That's why trolls on YouTube make me laugh because it's just hysterically ridiculous sometimes. They just they run away with themselves, I think, and they they just get a bit comical with it. It's like, you know, everybody's got an opinion and everyone's opinion is valid. But when you start getting nasty and violent and using bad language and silly, then your opinion is no longer valid to anybody. It's, it doesn't it doesn't matter. You know, you know, your opinion matters to yourself and it should only ever matter to yourself. <laughs> but you never want to go around forcing your opinion on people ever. That's the last thing you ever want to do. Like I would, I would, you know, if somebody asked me what guitar to buy, this a, guitar A or guitar B, it's like you need to try both and you need to see which one you prefer, not what one I prefer. Because what I like, you might not. I, I think I've said like a million trillion times. But, um, and that, that goes for amplifiers. It's like, you know, if somebody went out and bought an MG and said, oh, I, I bought an MG, but I hate it. It's like fair enough. That, that it didn't work for you. You don't. It's obviously not the amp for you. Go out and you know flog that and get get another one. You know, it's it's it, there's lots of. We're very lucky in variety we have in this day and age of amplifiers and all sorts of other stuff. So, so yeah. Anyway, kind of went to like I said, I went onto a bit of a, a troll rant there. But anyway, hope I haven't bored you all to tears with all that. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this Q and A, everybody. I've kind of lost it with that last question, I, but I hope some of it at least made sense. I don't. I got a bit worked up on the troll thing, but it, that's okay. That's okay. You know, we all need, we all need to you know we all need to learn how to not feed the trolls, so to say. Um, 
but yeah, it's, it's, it, yeah, people's opinion when they get nasty is yeah. Some of the comments I have had are borderline. Well, it's just comical. It's just hysterical to me. It's just uh, I, don't, I, don't, I delete them because I keep track of all my comments. Um, I just delete them. Oh, and by the way, everybody, uh, on the subject of comments, um, I am no longer able to reply to every comment like I used to be able to. I am gutted. At the same time, I'm blown away. And the reason for that is I get too many comments now. <laughs> but I will, I still go through them and I like every comment. And if there's a question, I will answer it. I promise. Um, but yeah, I do like every comment unless it's troll on, which we, in which case it gets deleted. Um... But I will like every comment. And if you do have a question and you put it in the comment section, I will reply, I promise, at some point. Sometimes it takes me a bit of a while to get to the comments, but I will reply to it, I promise. But, um, but I unfortunately can't say thank you to all of you. So I'll say it right now and probably try and get it across as much as I can in every video I do. Thank you all so much for supporting this channel. And, you know, you make this channel what it is. It's nothing I do. It's all you. It's all you are out there. So I am, I am forever grateful to you all. Thank you so much indeed. And I will see you again on Friday for another video. Thank you very much. Have a great morning, afternoon, evening, everybody. I'm going to go off and enjoy these pickups and the fact that knowing the fact that I'm getting Resident Evil 2 remake in the new year. And uh, thank you so much. I'll see you again on Friday.